here, I'm here. You just gotta find me. Where am I? It's like a where's Waldo. Where, where? Oh. Yeah, um, anyway, I was, oh, dang it, I'm setting up things for pictures, but it's not playing it right. Yet. I messed that up. Over here. Now, here. Yes. Uh huh. Okay. So I told you. Uh, I'm going to meet a on here. Okay. So, this lecture is the history of astronomy. History of astronomy. And as I mentioned um, in the uh, previous lecture, um, you can probably make the argument that it is what uh, astronomy is one of the oldest sciences um, because oldest science because of the whole sitting around the campfire having nothing else to do is looking up at the sky, stars at night, which are big and bright, deep in the heart of Texas. I know you're all laughing with me. Hey, one of those ha 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 chuckles with me. Anyway, but looking up at the stars and starting to notice the cycles that were going around. And from that, that they built calendars. Oh, and as I mentioned before, days come from uh, the cycle of the sun, uh, months come from the cycle of the moon, and year comes from the cycle of the stars. And it's actually that rotation of the stars all the way around again so it came back to the same time at night. One, one time around, it took a year to do that. Um, and so the calendars then became very important because you wanted to mark down various events that happened throughout the year. Uh, migrations, plantings, um, seasonal changes. Uh, in some places, the weather, the real drastic change in weather, dry season to wet season. But this early uh, astronomy was actually more just astrography. And if you think of graphy, it means mapping out, I mean, to, to visual graph. Graphic, yeah, it's a visual, I believe is the base. And so really all early astronomy was for about 2000 years-ish or more, well, up until 1700s or so, uh, was just simply mapping the sky and wanting to understand what the patterns of the, uh, the stars were and just creating accurate calendars and predictive um, uh, predictive calendars. So you could say, oh yeah, I know in a month, the, you know, the planets will be here, the sun will be in uh, that position, the moon will be in this phase and that sort of things. So, um, and we talked about what uh, the tools were that early astronomers used. And that was the quadrant, a clock, and basically a compass because you wanted to know the, the north-south um, the line because crossing the uh, celestial meridian was the easiest way to map it until the time that it crossed as opposed to trying to map everything out while they were rotating. And so really our history of the Western civilization, like a lot of things starts with the Greeks. There were an awful lot, I mean, as I said, every civilization was had some sort of um, astronomy um, and in fact which i think is kind of interesting a lot of the names of the stars that we know like betelgeuse alderaan are based on uh arabic astronomers names for them um actually and what's strangely enough a part of math algebra that al which is a very common and i don't i wish i knew what it meant in 
Arabic, is you got like Al Jazeera, you know, Al, Al Alamin, that Al uh, in algebra, it is uh, derived from an Arabic word, meaning, I don't know, meaning uh, it's a tough subject I had to take in middle school or high school. Okay, so we start with the Greeks because that's what kind of what Western uh, civilization starts with. So we start with the Greeks. And um, the first guy I'm going to mention, just because it was kind of interesting, uh, was Pythagoras. And he's about uh, 550 BC. And I mentioned him because he's the first person to write down um, the idea that the Earth wasn't the center, that the Earth circled something. Although, surprisingly, he didn't make it be the sun. He didn't have it be the sun that it was orbiting around, but he said it orbited some central fire. Um, now, his idea that the Earth orbited around something died off because, well, simple observations uh, really kind of defy that. And so we get to the next guy, Aristotle. Now, Aristotle was one of those uh, great thinker type guys. I want to say he was even the um, he was even the teacher for Alexander the Great. Student of Plato? I don't know. I'm not that big on this. Uh, but Aristotle. Well, he sets the tone for astronomy for about, yeah, almost 2,000 years uh, because he proposes a model for uh, the universe, I and mean, he's being this one big thinker, and he, ba he proposes a, a model for the universe based upon his observations, and so now he does his best to, of all the observations he's making of the universe, he's going to come up with a model for it, and shockingly, he puts the Earth at the center. Why? Well. Just simple observation says that the Earth is, is still, we don't feel it moving, and everything else is rotating around us. So we should be at the center because everything else appears to move, we're not. And he actually makes the argument that the Earth isn't moving by saying, if the Earth were moving, there'd be some sort of wind, we would notice this. So he actually uh, addresses that by saying, it can't be moving, there is nothing that says that we are moving. And so he proposes a geocentric or Earth-centric model. And so, and, and he logically lays out his argument. Now, remember, this is 300 BC. There are really no uh, astrological tools. He's just looking at what he's saying. He places the Earth at the center, and here's where I'll go over here because this is what my picture was, bah, 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 bah. come with me, come on. Well, actually, I'm not there yet. So, he proposes a model in which the Earth is at the center, the moon is on the closest ring to us, and then he's got Mercury and Venus on two rings next, and then the sun. And then he's got Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, the fixed stars, and uh, something that he calls the sphere of the prime moon. And I guess that was what he felt was what moved everything else. Now, this is a simplified version. He actually has 55 spheres. And that's to account for all the other minutia, you know, shooting stars and other things that he's seen. So he's got 55 spheres for it. But the Earth is at the center of, of, the, of this universe. And... It's honestly not bad model if you're just looking up in the sky and saying, okay, well, everything does appear to be rotating around us. There is uh, an important problem with this. I'll get to that just a moment, because I did notice while I'm here. Okay, this is an example of an extremely large quadrant. So there's a plaque on, on the wall. So this would be, I'd say about five feet tall. So this is probably about a 10 foot high, maybe more 15 foot high uh, quadrant. There is the scope of which you look through. And then along here would be the markings for the degrees for it. So uh, there is a, another view of a quadrant. Um, so this one it is, I don't think that's the same one. You know what it 
might have had. No, I don't think it is. So anyway, that is another quadrant. Oh, so while I'm here, one of the things that with uh, Aristotle's model of the universe is that Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn do not go around perfectly in a circle. Uh, they do something called retrograde motion. And retrograde motion is this mess. So if you go out, for instance, every night at about the same time, and, and I'd say this is maybe a couple of weeks apart, you will notice the background stars won't move. It's every night's the same, you're seeing the same stars, but you'll notice that there is one star that is moving through it. And this happens to be Mars. And Mars goes through this pattern, and then all of a sudden, it goes backwards before it starts to go forward again. Now, that was a real problem to try to explain. Why was it doing that loop-de-loop -loop motion? What happened, you know, to cause this, it was going on a nice circular pattern, but all of a sudden the, the circle reverses again, it does its motion. Now with Aristotle, the, the, the fact that he could explain almost all the observations fairly well, okay, there was one thing, retrograde motion, and the other thing was the fact that Venus and Mercury stay really close to the sun that he couldn't explain. His theory wasn't bad. He explains most of it. There are one or two little things. Now, astronomers spent an awful lot of time the next, say, 2,000 years trying to explain this. And it was solving this that led to the correct model of what the universe looks like. Now, before I move on, what causes retrograde motion? Well, it's the fact that Earth orbits faster than Mars does. And when we overtake Mars, it looks as if Mars does a loop-de-loop -loop motion. So when we start off here, now, mind you, you have to keep this, this is the observation from Earth. And so what it looks like as we come close to Mars is that here it's, because we've overtaken it, it appears to go backwards. And then when we get to this point now, when we're ahead of it, and it's behind us moving in this, starts moving in the same direction. But here, through this section here, it looks as if it's going backwards because we're overtaking it. So, but simply put, it's a, it's a matter of when we observe the planet from our point of view, we're both going around. It appears to do that loopy loop. -loop we're going faster around, it's going a little bit slower. So. That's what, that's what happens with retrograde motion. So let's go back here. Okay. So he has his geocentric model. He's got 55 spheres. Orbiting Earth. Um, but he's got a couple of problems. Oh, the other thing that he argues, and this is going to be critical, um, this is a critical point, he argues or, or states that the heavens are fixed and perfect. Heavens are fixed, meaning they're unchanging, and they are perfect. I mean, there's exactly the way that God's intended. Now, keep that in mind a little bit later because a different religion is going to adopt this. Yeah. Bonus points if you can guess which one. So he believes that the gods created the heavens exactly the way they are. They're not going to change at all and that they're perfect the way they are. And so that was one important part that he argues in his geocentric model or his theory of the universe. But he's got problems with this model. It explains a lot on the surface, but he's got problems with retrograde motion. Now the retrograde motion of Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Um, that the planets move on the sun's path. Oh, move, sorry. Move on sun's path, 
and as I said before, uh, Mercury and Venus stay close to the sun. Close to sun. Okay. That is, uh, that's a little weird. But you know what? He explains mostly everything else, so okay. Now, as astronomy moves on, astronomers become more and more accurate with, with taking down measurements of what's going on. Um, building a bigger quadrant, you get more accurate measurements. Um, just paying more attention to what it is, you know, having a better timepiece. Um, so the measurements get better, but this retrograde motion issue here um, really presents a problem to astronomers because they want to get an accurate uh, predictor of everything in the sky. And the, these three really bright stars, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, don't behave like this. And so they're constantly trying to fix it. So the next guy, this guy by the name of Ptolemy, which must have been a popular name. Um, yeah, the first Ptolemy I could think of was uh, a general for Alexander who was given Egypt, and then all the kings after him were called Ptolemy, and Ptolemy was a brother to Cleopatra, as the whole family after that was named that. But this guy's not a, uh, an Egyptian guy, uh, an Egyptian king, pharaoh. So he works with um, the geocentric model, and he comes up with a possible solution for um, retrograde motion. And so his possible solution is something called an epicycle. into retrograde motion. And his solution is epicycles. Now, I hear none of you asking me, what is an epicycle? I'm intrigued. Tell me more. Is there a newsletter or brochure I can write to and find out? Okay, so this is what the epicycle is. So here's Earth. Here's the orbit of Mars. Now, in looking at this, it says the problem is it does a little loop-de-loop -loop thing as it goes around. So I can't have this circle just kind of hit or like it's scratching a record and is dating me. Never mind. So what he proposes is the possibility of saying, okay, so on this orbit, there's another orbit. So this is going to rotate about that point as this rotates this way. And when we set that whole thing in motion, what's going to happen? Well, as this starts to rotate, that rotates, I'm going to get this motion. Damn! Problem solved. Look at that. I have got retrograde loop-de-loop -loop motion. Boom. Problem solved. Although whatever the equivalent of that was for him, I know. Um, feather drop. Which honestly wouldn't have been that dramatic. And, and, I, and I broke my hand when I did that. Bottom came out. So, very anticlimactic. So, Feather drop, I did it. Problem solved. And honestly, uh, this for the inaccurate measurements was not bad. It did it did come up with a possible solution and it was a decent predictor. Um, not terribly accurate, but remember the observations aren't as accurate. So his not being that accurate fits within a margin of error that people could live with. Yay, this solves it. Um, now, what he did, and I, whoa, the thing actually came out. No, the whole, sorry, the, the pen thing's on the ground. So I gotta, you know, you're gonna have to bear with me because to pause this thing, it'd have to go way over there. Ah, 
I can't get the can't get the top out. Ah. You gotta be kidding me! I drop it and it pops out, and now I can't get this stupid thing to come out. Oh well. I will just have to put this aside for now. We'll just work on it. Okay, so he comes with the epicycles. Now, what's interesting is he puts Mars, Jupiter, and and um, Saturn on these sort of things. But, and this is where I find it, he's tantalizingly close to what the truth should be. So, he's got the sun moving around, well, here. He's got the sun moving around this way. Now, He's noticed that, Ju uh, that that Mars and Venus are only appear on either side of this. So instead of actually putting them on an epicycle that goes around it, orbits around it, he finds two points in between and puts them on epicycles. He puts them on epicycles in between the two. I'm like, no, you were so close. It's almost like you're willfully saying, now. Nah, now, I know it would make sense if I put them orbiting around that because that's what they appear to do, but I'm going to have them orbiting in front of it. Ah, how much more simpler would that solution have been had you put it on there? Um, ooh, which leads me to um, a philosophical tool that um, scientists have kind of adopted, and uh, it shows up, and in, in, we'll mention here, and I'm sorry I didn't mention before, something called Occam's Razor. You may or may not have heard of it. And Occam's razor is an idea, a uh, philosophical tool. Um, but basically, I'm paraphrasing this. Basically, it is the idea that if you are presented with many possible solutions to a problem, that the solution to the problem tends to be the simplest. And that gets bared out quite a bit of times in science. And what we're going to find here with something that, that Pythagoras is doing, I mean, uh, Ptolemy's doing, is He's coming up with an ant solution, but to make this solution work, he's making it more and more and more complicated. And eventually, this is going to cause a problem to which people are going to go, yeah, this is just so complicated, this can't be right. And so here, he's added two more of these things in between the sun to, to make this retrograde and the motion work. So this is Ptolemy's solution, is making these epicycles. So, it seems to it seems to work because the observations aren't that great. And honestly, he kind of sets back astronomy by doing that because for the next yeah thousand years or more, people are trying to make this work. They're tweaking the epicycles to try to get these things to work. And so the observations keep getting better and better and better, more accurate. And the problem is. As they get more accurate, the epicycles work less. And so you have to tweak the epicycles to get them to work. And so we've got this problem of my observations are getting better. So I've got better data and my solution is worse. So I have to make it more complicated. So it's getting more complicated to so tweaking and trying to refine this. And honestly, because this is the wrong solution, you're never going to get it to work. So as you get more and more accurate data, this becomes harder and harder to make work. Okay, so astronomy goes along for another thousand-ish years or more, 1,500 years, and then the next most important um, person slash group uh, is actually Christianity. And by this, I actually mean the Roman Catholic Church. Catholic Church. And why? Well, but two reasons. One, the Roman Catholic Church was very, very interested in calendars. Lots of events go on throughout the year, and the church wanted a calendar to accurately mark these things down. And one of the things that became an issue was Easter. Easter is supposed to be in the spring. And with the calendars, 
being inaccurate, what was happening was that Easter was slowly moving into summer. And so church is like, yeah, this is not spring anymore. We need to fix it. And so the church hired an awful lot of astronomers to help tweak and build calendars. Um, the other thing was that the church was also interested in information. And so this burgeoning field of science um, now was starting to run, uh, starting to butt heads with the church with some of the ideas that they had. And the church did not like uh, science contradicting what they felt was the truth, God's truth, what the Bible said. And so based upon the writings of Thomas Aquinas, I don't know it's a monk, scholar. Eh, we'll just go with a biblical scholar. He had the idea that there should be no, that we're going to get from the place here, uh, that there should be no conflict between faith and reason. Faith and reason. Okay, faith. That's the Roman Catholic Church. So with the doctrine and reason is science. The Roman Catholic Church really likes the geocentric model. It fits with the teachings in the Bible. The idea that the earth is the center of the universe. God created the earth. This is the uh, what everything is centered about. The heavens are up above. Earth is, is down below. Um, also, that the idea that the heavens are fixed and perfect. God created the heavens exactly the way he wanted it, and they are perfect the way he wanted it. And they're unchanging because it was perfect when he made them. And so... They really have adopted the geocentric Aristotle model of the universe. And so they really are backers of that model. Um, the problem is, well, it's not working. And as science is going through and, and, and making observations, they're finding it's getting tougher and tougher to make this model work. Now, the Roman Catholic Church was kind of severe in some of its punishments. Um, there was actually a um, astronomer by the name of Bruno, who was burned at the stake for the heresy of saying that the Earth orbited around the sun. Now, he was given plenty of times to recant. He didn't and went to his death, still saying that this is what God told him, is that the Earth rotates around the sun. Now, he didn't have a whole lot of, of evidence for it, but it was a belief that he had. So the threat from the church was pretty strong. Uh, it was pretty real. It wasn't just, uh, we're going to get angry with you. We're going to tell everybody it's your uh, unbeliever, or unbeliever, or even excommunication. It was a, it was a threat of bodily harm. Even though excommunication, or you know, kicking out of being uh, kicked out of the faith is, is strong, um, they backed it up with more. So. Now the other thing I will say at this point as. You have the rise of science during the Renaissance, and, and you have the power of the Catholic Church, which, remember, early on, uh, before the Reformation, this was the only organized religion. And so the Roman Catholic Church is the church. And if you think about it, if you were growing up before the Reformation, you had two lords to answer to. You had your uh, the land that you were on belonged to a lord, and you had to answer to them and give them a certain amount of money, or you could ask permission to move or go around or fight for them if they asked. And then you had the church, which asked for a certain amount of, of your money because they were lords of your spiritual uh, world and body. And so you had these two lords you had to answer to growing up. Now, as science is rising, the Catholic Church kind of comes to an agreement with the science community. And basically, the church is more concerned that science is going to get the masses to believe something else. And whether these science geeks were just going to all sit around and talk about their weird ideas with each other, that was okay. But don't go spreading the ideas. You want to talk about that, we're not going to chase you down. It's too difficult, whatever. And so, the idea was, or, or, or the kind of the truths came up, is that science guys, if you just publish 
letters to each other, that's fine. Now, at that point, if you were a science guy in Poland or you were a science guy in Italy or Germany or England or whatnot, um, you didn't have to know all those different languages. The language that everybody knew, the lingua franca, the universal language of the time was Latin. And why Latin? Because that's what the Bible was in. And then most people who were literate were literate because they could read the Bible. So you learned Latin to read, and then you learned your common language too. So science people, when they would want to share ideas, would write out letters in Latin to each other, which was almost as, as good as having a code, because the common man couldn't read that. So even if they got the letter, they wouldn't know what it was. Uh, one, they were illiterate, they couldn't read languages, and it was in a language they didn't know, so it was in Latin. So, so long as science wrote their letters to each other in Latin, the church would look the other way. They weren't going to prosecute it. You share your ideas, that's fine. But if you write it in the local language and publish it, that's another story. That's when we're going to step in. So don't go telling the, the, the regular people. So. For a while, that's what the science community was doing. They're just sharing their ideas to each other. So the next big astronomer, then, the, the important to us, this guy by the name of Nicholas Copernicus. Maybe there's no I. Copernicus. Anyway, he's Polish, so I can guarantee you that's not his name. I believe that's either Anglicized or Latin. So, but anyway, uh, the pride of Poland. And so at this point, he lived from 1473, 1543. Now, a lot of people say, oh, I know Copernicus. He's the one that changed everything. Well, he published a paper and, okay, so let's back up below. So Copernicus actually worked for the church and I can't remember, he was a, a layman working for the church and an astronomer, a cleric, I think is what they, they referred to it. He was not a monk or I don't believe he was a uh, ordained, ordained in the church, but he worked for the church, he was a cleric for the church. And he started his career as an astronomer trying to make the Pol Ptolemaic model work, but for reasons that I mean, he put it in a book, but I don't even follow. But for reasons really kind of a mystery, he just felt, again, with the Occam's razor idea, this was getting too complicated. There had to be a simpler thing. And, well, his reasoning was it got too complicated. But why he put the sun at the center is kind of a mystery as to, as to why he did this. But he comes up with the heliocentric model. And he comes out of it because he is tired of the complications involved with making the, the Ptolemaic model. And for that, he puts the sun at the center and he puts everybody else in orbits around. So you got Mercury, Venus, Earth, on and on and on. Now, he then after he comes up with this, and, and, and granted, he's coming up with this by just based on observation. So he's got to look at charts that say this star is here then, that this star is here then. And from based upon that, he comes up with the idea that the sun must be in the center, we're all orbiting around it, which I find pretty incredible. That, and Because he's not looking at, at still got no computer models, he's just looking at entries uh, to what these stars are. So. Interesting thing is he waits almost till his deathbed to publish this. And he does that out of fear of the church. He didn't want to risk the wrath of the church. So he waits until basically he's he's going to die, then publishes it, I guess, kind of on the hope that maybe he'll get to God before the Pope does, and, you know, on the Pope phone, call God and say, hey, we got a problem here. Maybe he figures he can get up and explain first. But anyway... So he publishes this, and guess what the effect was? Meh. Um, for most astronomers, they looked at this and they said, that's an interesting idea, uh, very radical, but um, his predictive model 
was no better than the best Ptolemaic model. And so this wasn't overwhelming because, I mean, this didn't get taken because it wasn't overwhelming. It wasn't one where like, this is exactly perfect. It explains everything perfectly and simply. No, this one, about as good as the other one. And that's because there were a couple of problems with this that he didn't understand. So he had kind of a meh response to this. And that's because he had some problems with this model. Okay, so the props that he had, he put the orbits as circular. They are elliptical. Hey, what do I mean by elliptical? Okay, so this is a circle. This is an ellipse. A circle has one center point, an ellipse has two foci. And, and this is exaggerated, but in this case, the sun is at one focus point uh, along this, this big weird ellipse. Okay, so that's the other problem. And then he has the orbits at a constant speed. They're not at a constant speed. They vary. And so they vary. And actually what you find that here, it's faster. And when it's farther away, it's slower. Well, it's because of gravity. When you're closer to something, gravity makes you whip around faster. When you're farther away, you go around slower. So. And the other thing, and this is kind of interesting, the scientists of, uh, at the time said there are evidence, there should be evidence if this was true, and it's something called parallax. So there was no parallax. Yes, I'm going to explain parallax before there's anybody like, what do you mean? Okay, so. When the Earth orbits around here, so when it gets to here, and you look at the background stars, the background stars should look different than when you're way over on this side and looking. So they should be shifted. The same way as if you take your thumb in front of your face and blink your eyes back and forth, your thumb looks like it's jumping back and forth. That's parallax. So against the background, it looks like your thumb is here, 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 here. There should be parallax to the background of stars. Now, what was the problem with that? There is parallax. They're so far away that you can't notice the parallax without a telescope. So the instruments of the day were unable to measure the parallax that they had. So he publishes this, meh, it doesn't change anybody's mind, but he puts the idea out there. So now people are going, hmm, there's a, there's a thought here. And, uh, the next guy we're going to talk about, it, well, two guys, uh, is going to seize on that. Okay. So the next guy is Tycho Brahe. Now, Tycho Brahe is it's my vote for like the coolest astronomer. Um, now, then the reason I say this is because I think that, that science in general has a problem of a, a coolness factor. Um, unlike, you know, rock stars who, you know, they have date lots of models, uh, have big parties, they trash things, you know, they drive fancy cars that, you know, they're larger than life and science people have glasses and go, ha, ha, ha. Tycho Brahe was more rock star than that. Um, and like, I guess a lot of rock stars, he was a titanical ass. Um, Tycho Brahe was a Danish um, nobleman. Uh, so we already started off pretty rich. Um, and he was really, really, really uh, big into astronomy. That was, uh, I wouldn't say his hobby. I mean, it was actually what he did. His nobleman, he just inherited money from his lands. Well, he became the uh, court astronomer for the King of Denmark. And the King of Denmark gave him an island um, that he could build an observ uh, observatory on. 
Now, by all accounts, this was the best non-telescopic observatory ever built. I mean, he built a whole building just to observe the stars. And it would be nice if you could go visit it, but he was such, he was so cruel and horrible to the people of that island that when he died, the people tore the whole thing down. There's nothing that remains of it. I mean, they leveled the place because they hated him. So now, again, you're probably thinking, oh, he sounds like a horrible guy. Why is he your favorite? Uh, well, because he basically was a huge party guy. Now, what he's secondly maybe most famous for or most noted for was the fact that he had an artificial nose. Um, at one of his parties, he was a huge drinker. So one of his parties, he got drunk and he got in an argument with a guest who I think was another mathematician. And they got in an argument over some math thing. And uh, the argument scaled up to the point of him insulting this guy so much, the guy challenged him to a duel, and a uh, sword duel. And Brahe said, okay, let's go. Well, when Brahe got up, the guy realized that Brahe was super drunk. He said, you know what? We'll wait until you sober up. Brahe's like, no, Brahe, let's go now. The guy's like, uh, no, I don't want you. No, he insisted. So they went out and dueled right there. Well, this guy could have easily killed Brahe because he was stinking drunk. But what he did was he cut his nose off. And he figured that would be, you know, a horrible thing. If you have no nose, you're not going to be able to go out anymore. Brahe kind of embraced this and had several fake noses made. He had a gold nose, a silver, copper, several metal different types of noses that he wore. Now, they know this is actually true because they exhumed his body to find out. And they said, yeah, there were metal residues around his, his nose hole. It wasn't really a nose anymore. Um, so, yeah, he was a huge partier. And I looked this up. He also had a party moose. On his island... Uh, he had a, a moose, a, a, a tame moose, and there is a letter from the king of Bohemia, which is a part of Czechoslovakia, which basically said, hey, Tycho, great party, really enjoyed it, have a question, can I borrow your moose? And Brian wrote back, said, um, sorry, uh, glad you enjoyed the party, but um, the moose got drunk and fell down the stairs, he's dead. So, his party moose, not only did he have a moose but the moose was an alcoholic too and died falling down the stairs so party moose um anyway oh oh and he died because his bladder exploded he was at uh, some party for a king and as the the rules of the of the time stated that you were not to interrupt a king when they were talking uh i guess some king was talking and talking and talking Tycho had to pee he stayed there and his bladder actually ruptured, and a couple weeks later, he died from the infection from that, from being a big drinker and didn't pee. I would have wet myself, but anyway. Huh. Anyway, big partier, good astronomer. What he is most famous for is making the most accurate non-telescopic observations. non -telos observations okay but which still stand to this day well mostly because you don't have any more telescopes but he was a big proponent um, of he supported the Ptolemaic model Ptolemaic model so the geocentric with um, Epicycles, Blech. there and it'll come out. Um, now, the reason I'm going to mention him because I mean th this is basically all, all he did, but he did one other important thing, and he hired a guy by the name of Johannes Kepler. And Johannes Kepler, uh, 1571 to 16. Okay, Kepler was an Australian astronomer who had a really big problem for being an astronomer. He had horrible eyesight. Um, and that was huge because then he couldn't make his own observations. He had to rely on other people's observations to do his astronomy. Um, 
He also struggled with the Ptolemaic model, saying it was too complicated. When he saw Copernicus's model, he liked it. It was simple, it was elegant, and so he set about trying to fix it, trying to make this, you know, tweak it to see what it needed to make it work. Well, what he realized that he needed was the most accurate non-telescopic observations he could get his hands on. And so he basically wrote to Brahe to try to become his um, assistant. Now, he used an interesting tactic because uh, Brahe was a, such a narcissist and an egomaniac. He thought, well, if I just beg him, he's not going to do that. I say, please, please, please hire me. So he challenged him. He said, you know what? Uh, Brahe wrote, he said, hey, Brahe, you know what? I bet you if I had your observations, I could solve this whole Ptolemaic model thing in like eight days. You know, I, I can clear this right up because, you know, you've got the best observations and I know what I'm talking about. And he basically wrote back the, uh-uh, uh-huh, uh-uh, uh uh-huh, fine. You know what? I'll hire you. You come here and I bet you can't do it in eight days. Well, he didn't. He stayed on for about eight years working for him as a... Um, as an assistant, so once he got there, he got in. Now, what was interesting, though, too, is that Brahe dies before he uh, finishes his work and realizes, uh-oh, I'm in trouble here. He packs his stuff up, and he accidentally packs up all of this guy, all of Brahe's observations. And so when he leaves, he take, they just kind of go with him. Brahe's family understood that these these observations well, were worth money. They could make a lot of money copying them and selling copies to other people, you know, people like Kepler who would have done that. So they immediately go in and they find that they can't find the observations. So they write Kepler basically going, hey, Kep, uh, when you uh, packed up all your stuff, did you happen to see uh, all the observations? Kepler's like, oh, man, um, you know what? Still unpacking. It was a big trip. Uh, let me look through that, get right back to you. And he stalled them for a couple of months while he busily wrote down all the observations he could and then wrote back, oh, well, what do you know? They must have like fallen on my carpet when I rolled it up, oh, send it right to you. So he got a free copy of them by just kind of misplacing them and keeping them. And from that, Kepler comes up with a very important piece of work. And that was the three laws planetary motion. And in this publication, The Three Laws of Planetary Motion, he solves the issue and makes the heliocentric model work. And so what are his laws? Well, one, he figures out that the orbits are elliptical, which we already said they are. So he figures it out. Number two, that the orbits, and this is a little complicated, the orbits sweep equal area over equal time. And what exactly does that mean? Well, what he found out was, so say that's one month, and that takes one month to go from here to here. So from this point to this point, or from this point to this point, takes one month. What he figures out is if you calculate the area that this sweeps, they're equal. Okay, what's the implication of that? What he realized is it's faster here, it's slower there. He found this weird mathematical relationship of the areas that, that it covered when it did its orbit. So this is the this is orbital speed. There's an orbital speed. And then the last one is uh, super complicated. It's 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 a super complicated uh, math relationship. And when he says here. Uh, on the third one is that planets closer to the sun go faster, farther away go slower. That, that's basically what he, what he said. So he realized that Mercury orbits faster and that uh, Saturn orbits a whole lot slower. 
What he doesn't understand at this point is that it's gravity is the force that's causing this. He's just describing what's going on. So he publishes this, and that this this now starts to make uh, a difference. This has got people looking at this going, hmm, interesting. Okay, I get this. So this might be it. This is now accurate. He is explaining what the what what the motions is, and this is way better now than the model, the Ptolemaic model. The problem is. This model is not going to be adopted by the church. The church is not going to basically let this be public knowledge. And the other thing that they're kind of missing here, even though this is nice theoretical, where's the evidence for it? So you've got a theory that explains it, but there's a lot of theories. Um, so where's the evidence to back this up? That is where the next guy comes. Next guy is Galileo. Galileo Galilee. He is fifteen sixty four, sixteen thirty. Uh, Galileo is in the mold of. Um, uh, like a da Vinci. Um, he is a, a, a Renaissance man in the, in the true sense that he does everything. He's, he's basically just a, an all around smart guy. Uh, he dabbles in math and sciences and in arts, uh, a little bit of everything. So he's just trying to expand basically just knowledge in general. Um, now what people like Galileo did is they found patrons. So like da Vinci to do all his work, his research, painting and whatnot, you need to find a rich guy that was going to pay for all of it. Excuse me. Galileo does the same thing. So he gets a patron, and I can't remember. It might have been the, the Medici's or something like that. So a, a patron of, a, of a, a city state or a state in Italy, and he basically says, listen, I can do, uh, I can create things for you. I can paint art for you. I can teach your kids, you know. I can do stuff for your family if you allow me to do this research. And, and for the most part, the trade-off, kind of like in modern times, was education. I'll teach your family and kids, and then I'll do my research. And everything I do, I'll present to you, you can use. And so like with uh, da Vinci, um, he created a lot of war weapons. Why? Well, what do you think uh, You know, princes are going to want? They're going to fight, and they need weapons. So. He came up with those ideas. Galileo, kind of the same thing. Now, Galileo didn't invent the telescope, but he hears about optics and he creates his own. The telescope had already, uh, one or two, I think had already been made, but he makes his own telescope. And he offers this to his patron by saying, hey, look, you can use this telescope to see what the other guys are doing. The guy's like, this is awesome. I can spy on them. And you know, he, there was a perfect implication for war with this. Galileo takes it instead of doing that, he's going to look up at the sky. And so he is one of the first people to use a telescope to look up at the heavens. Well, and as far as we know, he's probably the first one that wrote it down. So he might not have been the first one to use it, but he's the first one that made the observations with the telescope. So first to observe the sky with a telescope. And what he finds kind of astounds him. Um, first, he looks at the moon, and he notices that the moon, which until then, the dark spots were thought to be oceans. They're not oceans. They're just darker parts of um, rock. But he notices the moon is covered in craters. And he said, goes, that's odd. Um, the moon looks like, you know, a stop sign in West Virginia. It's like all shot up. So... Does God just get bored on the weekends and shoot the moon just for <laughs> throw back a couple cores? So why does the moon have all sort of craters in it? That doesn't make sense if that's perfect. I mean, perfect wouldn't be scarred with all these these holes on it. So that's one that has him kind of scratching his head. Um, the other thing that he does is he sees Jupiter. So when he goes up and sees Jupiter, he notices that Jupiter has these 
four little bright spots around him, which he actually refers to as ducklings. Um, and as he watches, he notices that they move behind and then across. He actually sees them orbiting around Jupiter. Now, that's critical because the model for uh, the, geocent uh, the geocentric model of the universe has everything orbiting Earth, us. This is actually orbiting something else. Another critical bit to support this idea of heliocentric. Heliocentric. So the last bit that he notices is the phases of Venus. Now, we know the moon orbits us, and we know that we get phases because of the the angle of the Earth to the sun to the moon. So we know that if you look at it this way, you're going to see half a moon because half is dark, and it's because of the way the sun shines on it. Well, what he knows in looking at Venus is if here's the sun, what he notices is that Venus I'll do it the other way since it's uh, so it looks something like that. What he notices is that when it's close to this point, it's really full as it moves out here, it, it starts to disappear. What he's what he realizes he's seeing is the phases of Venus as it orbits around the sun. And here he's got proof that a planet orbits around the sun, not around us, but around the sun. And so this is the, the really the, the proof necessary to show, to support what um, Copernicus and Kepler have said is the heliocentric model. Um, now, here's where he makes a critical mistake. So when he figures this out, realizes I've got the evidence to support this, he could have just published this in Latin and, and pass it on to, to his friends, uh, but he doesn't. For some reason, he decides to publish this in Latin, I mean in, in Italian, and basically put it out to the population. And as was the time, when you publish something, you just didn't, you didn't write it out, well, we found this, notice this, this. You publish this as an allegory. You publish this as a story. So... That's how people kind of read things. And in this story, there is this wise traveling salesman who goes to this town and tells the dumb mayor about how um, the universe is structured. Unfortunately, he made the dumb mayor sound an awful lot like the Pope, and the Pope recognized that, and that the smart salesman was a lot like Galileo. So Galileo gets summoned to, um, the, church, the, to the Pope, and the Pope basically says, I'm giving you a choice. You're going to either publicly recant or, um, yeah, smell that smoke out there. So given the choice that he was going to be locked up, possibly um, burned at the stake for this heresy, he does go back and forth on this. He's an old man at this point. He's about 70. But he does decide eventually to recant. His punishment at that point was that he was under house arrest. He could stay in his mansion. Um but he could still have visitors. And he's a 70 year old man, so really, where was he going? So it was basically a face saving measure by the church. And so Galileo still had all, you know, he could do his correspondence to his friends and they could visit him, but he couldn't leave. He was under house arrest. Um, and his letters debating whether or not to recant or not are still in existence. He wrote to his daughter and uh, the letters have been saved. So it is kind of interesting to see somebody struggling with his faith and with what, what he sees in science. Um, so, okay, so what, let's go back, what are the evidence here, so, there's the evidence that he found was craters on the moon, moon, uh, Jupiter's moons, and the phases of Venus. Uh, okay. Now, at this point, we're already starting to get into the Reformation. So the hold that the Catholic Church has on the science, scientific community is starting to wane, um, uh, especially for scientists that are no longer in Catholic uh, countries. They no longer have to worry about 
uh, the, the role of the Catholic Church. And so science is, is starting now to feel more free to publish whatever, and this absolute authority of the church is starting to, to wane. And so at this point, we're going to move a little bit less from straight astronomers and more into the world of, uh, well, pure science. And so the next guy is going to mention here that's important because at this point, there's a lot of bunch of astronomers that make individual discoveries. So between, uh, well, we've got uh, astronomers like Herschel who discover Uranus uh, and the Milky Way. Um, and so there's a lot of other discoveries as people get telescopes and they found this and they found that. Um, but those are, are more of just kind of milestones of things we found. So real groundbreaking things. Next guy is Isaac. Newton, who, quite frankly, would get my vote for maybe smartest guy ever. I'll explain that in just a minute. So, um, Newton is famous for all of his discoveries of light, motion, gravity, uh, force, you get them all, well, uh, uh, optics, lots of different things. Uh, he give, he's considered kind of the father of physics. Um, I mean, it, it, it's kind of amazing to have a whole branch of science named after you, or, or you found it. And that's basically what he did. Um, interesting thing about Isaac Newton is that he probably was autistic. Um, I, I read a very compelling article a couple of years ago where um, some uh, researchers studied uh, basically uh, Newton's papers and, and, and what people have written about it. So they, they really dug deep into the interactions that Newton had uh, with people. And they've come to the conclusion that he was probably very high functioning autistic. Um, and, and part of it was what was really kind of interesting about him is he really didn't, he really wasn't that interested in publishing to gain fame and recognition for these things. He just wanted to know. He did this out of his own pure curiosity, and he really struggled with the politics of uh, science. You know, having how to publish, who to be nice to, how to, to gain favor, to get positions. He hated that stuff. He hated playing any of those games. He honestly did most of his discoveries uh, during the plague when he was sent home. When people fleed cities, he went back to, uh, to his home, to his farm, and had his own little research, and he made discoveries there. And his friends had to basically beg him to publish these things. He discovered them, told people, but they're like, you need to publish and let the world know. He was kind of ticked off about the way he was treated. And so it took a lot of cajoling for him to, to publish stuff. So what is it that, that, that he really did? He started to, to look at the physical world. He was one of the first ones that said, I wanted to describe and understand why things move the way they do. I see the world, you know, behaving this way. So for instance, when I throw this pen, why does the pen arc the way it does? You know, how, how do I describe that motion? And that was one of the things is, is, you know, what he's famous for the three laws of motion is why do things move the way they do? Well, what is it that causes it? And so just in describing the way it did, he goes, what's the force? And he, he defines gravity, that force that moves things, how they move, laws of motion. And then in looking at how we sense the world, he wanted to know more about light because he understood light is how we get our information to our eyes, but what are the properties of light? And so he was the one that figured out that white light is actually all the, the colors combined. So all the wavelengths of colors in one, he used a prism to split it apart and then used another prism to bring it back together to show that you could split light into its components and then bring all those components back into white light. But if you left one of those out, the light would no longer be white. It took all of them 
And he's very famous for uh, his optics. He created the modern telescope. So, and I have an example of one of those here. So he created this. This is actually was referred to as a Newtonian telescope. And this telescope, you can see down here, it has uh, a mirror down at the end. Get it? And so the light goes down through here, bounces in the mirror, and comes back and hits the secondary mirror, which then tilts it out at 45 degrees here. Now, why a mirror? Well, when we get to telescopes, I'll go into more detail about that. But basically, light going through glass gets distorted. Light bouncing off a mirror doesn't get distorted at all. It just bounces. It just reflects. And it doesn't get changed in any way. It doesn't get, get distorted. And so he realized that in studying optics and came up with a mirror telescope as opposed to a glass one because it was better. I think one of the things that, that is most incredible about him is as he was thinking about motion and how to describe how things fly around and move, the mathematics of the time were not sufficient to explain that. And so with the concepts he have about explaining this, he develops calculus. So he comes up with a whole class of mathematics just to be able to explain his ideas of motion. So the, the, the creation of, of calculus was secondary to his wanting to explain the motion. And what was really interesting was he comes up with calculus and when he publishes all his things and he explains what calculus is, there was a German mathematician who was trying to come up with calculus who lost his flippin' mind, accused Newton of cheating and said, he stole it from me. Newton's like, I don't care. You get credit or whatnot. I was just trying to get this. He's like, I, I don't, I don't. He wouldn't even engage the guy. He's like, whatever. You have it. I don't care. It's fine. It's yours. But the German, I think it was Leibniz, just, just couldn't, couldn't deal with that. And um, I don't know. If you've ever taken calculus, you might not have gotten an explanation for, for, what, it, for what it is. I know they always say, oh, it's the area under a curve. So it's the ability to tell you exactly what that is. And, you know, they kind of tell you, well, you know, you can do it by making one box representation. Well, then you can do, you know, many boxes. And as you get to an infinite number of boxes, it's going to tell you what it is. Okay, that's kind of one explanation, but I'm going to give you kind of a very general reason why uh, Newton wanted uh, calculus or why it, it helped him. So. Say you've got a, a you know a cannon, and it shoots off a cannonball. Okay, Newton saw that when you shot this cannonball, there was a lot of bits of information or a lot of things going on here, all related to each other. For instance, as this goes, there's a distance. This is traveling. So there's distance here that it's traveling. There's a speed that it has as it's traveling. There's also an acceleration that it's doing. Uh, and there's a, a jerk that changes in acceleration. Um, so there's a lot of different things that at the same time are all affecting each other. And so what Newton does with calculus is, you know, when you have a, an integer from say zero to 10 or whatever, um, you know, function of x, um, you've got like x to the third plus, 4x squared plus 8x plus 9. What Newton does in looking at this equation, that, that there are layers to this equation, and that by transforming them, or kind of like peeling off layers of the onion, getting closer into the center, you get to different layers. And so all of this right here is, will describe distance. So the whole equation will tell you how far this is going to go. Beep. or at any time, how far it's gone. But if you peel this off, and I'm not going to get you derive this, in which I think this becomes 3, uh, something like x squared over 3. I can't remember anymore. And this is uh, what, like x over 4 plus 8, and then that gets canceled. But you peel down this layer, then underneath that, you're going to get speed. And then if you peel again, you're going to get velocity. I mean, uh, you're going to get acceleration. And then underneath that, you're going to get jerk, which is the, the change in acceleration. 
But what he saw was there's a way in this equation that I can, and this is which with any with, with, at, at any point, I can take and I can peel this down and I can find exactly what the distance should be, the speed should be, the acceleration at any one of these points. Because um, it's all in there at the same time. And the math at the time didn't work for that. And that's what helped him with motion and kind of what he needed was this thing to go, ooh, I got it. So, um, now, calculus can be used for lots and lots of other things um, because of that. It's a very handy map, but that's that's kind of the essence of what he was looking uh, for it to do. Okay, so all those different things we do. So what are the what are the critical things say for us? This is three laws of motion. And what's amazing about these three laws that he came up with is that you can explain almost all the motion in the universe, macro universe. So what you can see, you can explain almost every motion just using these three, uh, applying these three laws. Um, and that's simple. So one, the first law, an object in motion tends to stay in motion. An object at rest tends to stay at rest. So an object in motion, space in motion, and an object in rest, space in rest. This is referred to as inertia. And what he's saying here is objects won't move on their own. You have to you have to push them. If they're not moving. They'll, they won't move unless you make them. If they're moving, they're not going to stop unless you do. And what's kind of interesting about this is whether it's in motion or rest doesn't matter. It's all your frame of reference. Um, something could look at rest if you're moving with it. You're like, oh, it's not moving at all. Now you stop, and it looks like it's moving. Whether it's moving or stopping, it's the same thing. Nothing is forcing it to do something. Then it's, it's not going to change whatever it's doing. Number two. Force equals mass times acceleration. So F equals MA. So force equals mass times acceleration. That, that's where he's defining what a force is. So you have to take a mass and you have to accelerate it. So change its velocity. So you can't have it just at, at, at rest. You have to constantly be changing it. So you know it's a, it's a push. I, honestly, it's really hard to, to put into words exactly what a force is because a force is a force. Uh, it's like trying to define duh. Uh, it's a duh. So anyway, so it's mass times acceleration. You have to have an acceleration. So you have to be changing its speed, or or you can't have it at rest. So and it's different from. Um, momentum, which is if you have like a car moving at a constant speed and it hits something, well, when it hits something, it slows down. And so there's a change of acceleration. It was, it, it, it decelerates. And so it applies a force to it. But as it's just moving along, there is no force. The way that you can tell that is if you're sitting in a car that's going at a constant speed, you don't feel the car pushing you. So the car accelerates or decelerates, then you feel a force from the car on you. But if you're just sitting in a car going 60 miles an hour constantly, you wouldn't feel anything. If you closed your eyes, you'd say you weren't moving because it's not exerting a force. There's no acceleration change. And then the third is for every force or for every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. reaction. Um, so I throw this pen. As I push this pen, the pen is pushing back on me. Now, for this, not a whole lot of pushback on me, so not going to feel a whole lot. Um, now, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, you know, something that weighs as much as you do, um, you know, you push it, you might feel that, yeah, both of you. So, it, you know, you've got two equal things on ice and you push. Oh, yeah, you're standing on, say, an ice skating rink and you have somebody who weighs as much and you 
you push off on that person, you're both going to go away at equally the same speed. It's, it's an equal reaction. The force you push on them is going to be equal to you because if your masses are the same, your accelerations are going to be the same. So you're going to push away. Now, that person weighs half your weight. You're going to go back at one speed. They're going to go back at double that speed. So these three, it's all you need to describe the way things move in the atmosphere from galaxies, stars, cars, you know, whatever. Okay, the other thing that, that he, which we're going to, which has a, a implication for astronomy is his law of universal gravitation. That is gravity equals the gravitational constant, we're not going to worry about that, the mass of the first object times the mass of the second object divided by the distance between them. So if I have two objects, that's the distance between them. Now, what's the implication of this? Well, because you're dividing by the, the, the force, so it's the two, two, the mass of those two things, so the more mass of the stronger gravity is going to be, but it's divided by their distance between them. So as I make this distance bigger, the force is exponentially weaker. What do I mean? Linear would be if I pull it one thing away, it's one times uh, weaker. Two away, two times weaker. Three away, three times weaker. Exponential would be one time away, it is one time weaker. Two times away, it's four times weaker. Three times away, it's nine times weaker. And so I get to objects that are kind of far away, gravity becomes really weak. But if I get them really close, gravity is really strong. So when you pull things away, gravity gets weak really fast. So think about how flipping strong the sun's gravity must be that you can go a light year away from the sun and you would still be in the gravitational pull, still in the gravitational pull and slowly fall back to the sun. So it is a huge, huge force. So, and then think how weak it is for two atoms or if I had two pens, you know, I take two pens and I put them out in space. Think how weak that gravity would be and how long it would take for them to slowly come together, which they would. Gravity would slowly pull them together. So. Okay. So here is now the, the definite or, or the defining of um, physics or the study of science. Now, after uh, Newton, Scientists are starting to look at the sky and wonder what are those objects? What are they doing? How are they behaving? Not just let's just map them and I don't care. And so the transition has come from basically astrography, just mapping it out to astronomy and wanting to know what the objects are, how they behave and how they move. And that's what uh, Newton kind of ushers in is this the modern, modern astronomy. And so at this point, there's a lot of astronomers coming up with ideas. Uh, but really, the, the, the only, the last one I'm going to mention here, the biggest is Albert Einstein. And Albert Einstein really is not an astronomer. He's a theoretical physicist. The o Physicists. Yeah, I mean, again, I think I mentioned this before. If you want an example of a pure thinker, this guy, um, he didn't even know the math well enough to explain his ideas. He just came up with thought experiments as to how to explain certain things. And there's lots of videos out there if you want to watch it about him. Um, I know that PBS has, I think it's Nova. If you look up those on Einstein, it's very well done. I think easy to, to comprehend and also gives an insight as to what uh, an incredible thinker 
uh, Einstein was. Um, so Einstein, Einstein comes at an age in which um, sciences are different compartments. There's chemistry, there's physics, uh, there's electromagnetism, um, there's materials. There's all these different sciences, uh, but they're, they're not linked. And, and Einstein looks at it and goes, you know what? There is a connection to all of these sciences. And that's what really drove him in sciences, was looking and saying, no, there's an underlying There's an underlying connection to all of these things. And that's what drove him into, into looking and saying, okay, you know what? I'm going to find the connective pieces um, to, to science. And the ones that we're concerned about is when he looked at the physical world and trying to connect the, the different ideas and forces. And he comes up with his theory of general relativity. Theory of general relativity. Now, this is kind of a complicated theory, and there's a lot to unpack in here. But I'm going to talk about the things that that um, were important to astronomy. So, what he's saying here, and partially, is that. Um, there are things about the universe and, and, and ways of perceiving the universe that really perception of the universe is relative. Um, and by relative meaning there's no absolute, that the truth is always based upon your viewpoint. And to give you an example, say uh, you're out in space, absolutely black, you can't see anything else, no reference point. You're sitting there and another person goes, goes by. And you go, wow, that person's moving past me. Now, we change to the other person, and we realize the other person was sitting in black space, seeing nothing, and they saw you move in the opposite direction. So who was moving, who was still? But all depends on who you were. If it was me looking at you go by, I'd say, I'm still, they're moving past. If it was you looking at me, you'd say, no, I'm still, he's moving past in the opposite direction. Now we get a third person who says, no, I saw him going this way and her going that way. <coughs> Who's right? All three of them are right. Because it depends upon your point of view. And it gets weirder and more complicated when you apply these things to the universe. Um, but anyway, so he's saying, yeah, we can't have one absolute for the universe. You have to you have to state what your reference point is and then build your truth from that reference point that you state. So that's one thing. The other thing that he does is he's really bothered by gravity, um, that gravity is a force. And he looks at it and goes, I, I don't think this is true because gravity is very, behaves almost exactly like acceleration. And acceleration is a component of a force, it's not a force. And so he comes up with this thought experiment about what would happen if somebody fell off a building and they could fall infinitely. And he realizes that if they started to fall off a building infinitely, they would eventually get to the point of not feeling like falling at all. Everything would fall with them and it would just be floating there. And so if he didn't see the building, they wouldn't know they were falling. They would just be floating. And wow, I know this is, this is, it's, it is kind of complicated. But anyway, in, in doing his thought experiments about what gravity is, he starts to come up with the idea that gravity is not a force, it's an effect of the universe. And he starts thinking about how things behave in the universe. And he realizes, or he, he, he comes up with his theory that the universe is not a nothing. It's a something. So we exist in a fabric of the universe. And that fabric is called space time. So the universe is made of space time. Now, it's called space time because it's not just space. Time is linked to it. And 
if you stretch space, you also stretch time. Um, give, give you an example. If you're going through space, so you've got two photons traveling through space, two light particles traveling through space, and this particle happens to go through a bent part of space time and this doesn't, well, this one has to travel faster to meet up with this photon because they have to come back to the same spot at the same time. But this one has to move faster to get through it. I know this is, this is complicated, it doesn't make sense, but, but bending space time is going to cause time to actually, in this case, move slower so that because it had to travel over a longer time. This, this should have taken longer, but it had to go slower, so it was the same time that this took. So the more closer you are to a gravity source, the slower time goes for you. And strangely enough, the faster you go through space, the slower time goes for you. They've tested all this, and it is absolutely true. So this, this is backed up. This is no longer a theory. This is actually, that, that part is true. So that space time can be can be bent by mass. So I am actually causing the space time around me to be bent slightly. Um, so like this could be caused by you know Earth causes a and that makes a gravity well. And the way to think about that is to think about having a trampoline and you put a bowling ball on it, um, and how that curves the space time towards it. And if you put a marble on that trampoline, it would slowly roll, and then when it gets closer, it roll fast. So out here, it would roll slowly, and then you go, Whoop. and if you put it at an angle, it would orbit around. It would circle around. And that analogy works well, but it's in three dimensions, not just two dimensions like that. And there were a couple issues with the way that Isaac Newton described um, gravity. There are, there are a couple of things that that he can't explain. One of them was, uh, for instance, that Mercury doesn't orbit just like this. It does something called precession. It does this. So it slowly moves around like that. Now, you can't explain that with Newtonian physics, but you can explain it if it's curved space. And so Newton explains this little anomaly that, that happens. So that's one thing here is that he he comes up, which has since been proven, the idea that space is, uh, space time is a thing and that gravity is the bending of space time. Um, the other thing that he comes up with is probably what they think everybody knows him for E equals MC squared. It's like, okay, that's the equation everybody knows, but, but I don't think people truly understand the implication of this. And the implication is that's energy. Energy equals mass times the uh, speed of light squared. What he's saying here is that energy equals mass, mass equals energy. That in essence, if you want to think about it, I mean, very simply put, is that what I made up, the mass that makes up me, is kind of like frozen energy. And that if you could unfreeze it, you would release a huge amount of energy. So the speed of light squared. So for the math, that, that actually, I could probably blow up the earth if you were to release all the energy from every little atom that's locked up in me. That's how much energy it is. It's just a, I would make a huge explosion. I'm a huge amount of frozen up energy. Um, it, it, it is a huge number. Take a little bit of, take mass and the speed of light squared, which is a huge number, and that equals the amount of energy that it takes. So. That was the implication, and why did that was that big for atomic energy? Well, they realized if we could break a little bit of mass, we can release a huge amount of energy in a bomb. So, okay. Um, ooh, you know what? I, I'm not sure. This one doesn't. The pictures aren't as uh, critical. But we'll go back here and see what pictures they did have. Um, I apologize, I got kind of wrapped up. Ooh, okay. There is. Um, Honestly, that's Ptolemy's uh, graph, which he here he's got some epicycles for the for the different um, things. But that's how complicated his his drawing for it was. Um, and there is 
I want to say this is what Brahe did. He actually said, okay, let's put Venus and Mercury orbiting the sun. So I'm getting close. Um, oh, and there's a uh, just kind of a representation of a gravity well, you know, the bending of space time. So, but that's what I got for you now. Um, so, uh, oh, I'm going to turn it off from here. I will uh, see it. Uh, there it is. And goodbye. Stop. Okay, no.